Revelation 19 verse 15, and he treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. A sermon by Jonathan Edwards. In hell is inflicted the fierceness of the wrath of a being that is almighty. John has before given an account of the vision he had of the destruction of Babylon. And in the beginning of the chapter, we have an account of the songs and alleluias that were in heaven on that occasion. Here John has a further revelation of the destruction of the enemies of the church in a vision of Christ's coming forth out of heaven on a white horse. And he goes forth with his armies with him to battle against his enemies. And he and the enemies of his church meet together in a mighty army. The glory of that warrior as he comes forth to battle is variously described. The manner of his coming forth out of heaven on a white horse probably signifies justice. He comes to execute justice. His names, faithful and true, word of God, king of kings, and lord of lords. His majesty, eyes as a flame of fire. His incomprehensibleness, a name written that no man knows. His vesture dipped in blood which may refer to his shedding his own blood or the blood of his enemies, as it seems to be understood in Psalm 63, verses 2 and 3. By his retinue, as the army that he led forth, what he does, verse 11, in righteousness he does judge and make war. In verse 15, out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treads a winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. He sustains very different offices, or does a very different work towards his people and his enemies. To one, the Savior, and the other, the Destroyer. One he rules with a gold scepter of grace, others with a rod of iron. For one cast into winepress himself, the other treading them down in the winepress of the wrath of Almighty God. Christ has all things committed into his hand, the managing of all the effects relating to the eternal state of man, both rewarding and punishing, belongs to him in his kingly office. As judge of the world, it belongs to him to tread the winepress. We have several times this expression used in this book, where destruction of the wicked is compared to the treading of the wine press. This seems to be a reference in what is here said to the 63rd of Isaiah at the beginning, now mention of him because now in an especial manner, going about such a work, awful judgments inflicted on the wicked world, not excluding their destruction in hell. Doctrine. In hell is inflicted the fierceness of the wrath of a being that is almighty. Three propositions. Number one. In hell there is inflicted the wrath of God. Number two. God whose wrath is there inflicted is an almighty being. Number three. There is there inflicted the fierceness of his wrath. First proposition, those that are in hell do suffer the inflictions of the wrath of God. The wrath of God is inflicted on all that are in hell. None are there but what are the subjects of the infliction of divine wrath. That is the end of their being there. All that are there are cast down into that region of darkness for that end. There are none that are natives of that world of misery, but all that are there are fallen from some other state, from some other world, and are cast down there out of their former state, for that end that they may suffer the wrath of God. And it is for that end that their beings are thus upheld, namely that they may there continue to suffer God's wrath. 
Yea, that place was made and prepared of God on purpose, that it might be for this use, the infliction of his wrath. God has no other use for that place. As heaven is prepared on purpose to be a place of the manifestation of God's love, so hell is prepared for the inflictions of God's wrath. They that are in hell suffer the infliction of divine wrath two ways. Number one, as all that they suffer there may be said to be inflictions of God's wrath. The sufferings of those that are in hell are very manifold and various. They have all kinds of misery and are deprived of all kinds of good. But yet God's wrath may truly be said to be the sum of their misery. There is a twofold punishment that the damned suffer, the punishment of loss and the punishment of sense. They suffer the punishment of loss. They have lost the favor of God. They have lost heaven and eternal life that they have had opportunity to obtain. This doubtless is very grievous and terrible. It is no small part of their punishment when they shall see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God and you yourself thrust out. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Luke 13, verse 28. It will be a dreadful thing to them. And being shut out of heaven is from time to time represented as a very awful punishment that the damned will suffer. Thus a manner is represented in the parable of the ten virgins. They were shut out from the marriage. They come too late and find the door shut and cried, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he replied unto them, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. It will be a very dreadful punishment to be eternally separated from God, from his glorious and gracious presence. Now there is no positive immediate infliction in this part of their punishment, because this part of their punishment is negative, yet the damned suffer the wrath of God in this loss. It is in wrath that they are thus shut out of heaven and precluded the gracious presence of God. It is in wrath that God casts them out of his sight, drives them away from his presence. God speaks in wrath when he says to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you that work iniquity. Matthew 7, verse 23. In the last sentence that shall be pronounced in the world, that we have an account of, Matthew twenty five forty one. Then shall he say to them on the left hand, Depart from me, you cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. In that is included both the punishment of loss and punishment of sense. The punishment of loss is, in that part of the sentence, Depart from me. The punishment of sense is, in the latter part, into everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. But the wrath of the judge is expressed in both. They shall suffer not only the loss of eternal life, but a deprivation of all outward good. There will be the divine wrath in this also, and in what wicked men will suffer of the punishment of sins, besides what they will suffer from the immediate hand of God. They will suffer a great deal from devils. The devil is a roaring lion who goes about seeking whom he may devour. And doubtless, when they are delivered up wholly into the power of that roaring lion, they will suffer a great deal from him. But yet it may be said to be the wrath of God that they will suffer in this. For it will be from the wrath of God that they are thus delivered up into the hands of Satan to be tormented by him. They will be instruments of one another's torment, yet it will be from the wrath of God. Thus all the suffering may be said to be the infliction of the wrath of God. Though some are more immediately from the hand of others, the wrath of God is the sum of the punishment of wicked men. They may be said to suffer the wrath of God in suffering these things two ways. Number one, as the wrath of God is the first cause of all this punishment, in other words, it is the first influencing cause, not the first procuring cause. 
because the first procuring cause is sin. But all that wicked men suffer is a fruit of the wrath of God. Second causes may be made use of, and devils and wicked men may be the instruments of much. In both the negative and positive part of their punishment, in all they suffer the wrath of God. Number two. Thus consider that it is from the wrath of God the sting of it all. It renders it all much more insupportable. If they suffer the loss of heaven and the cruelty of devils, their suffering such a loss and coming into such circumstances would not be near so dreadful to them if they had not this to consider that all this is brought on them is the fruit of the hatred and wrath of God. If they could have that to think of under all, that they had the favor and pity of God, that would be a support to them. But to think that, on the contrary, God hates them with a perfect hatred, and that all this is a fruit and effect of it, it will make their state abundantly the more dark and doleful and gloomy, and more sinking and insupportable to them. So that whatever may be the next and immediate cause of their suffering, the wrath of God is the foundation of it, and the sting of it, and indeed the sum of it. The wrath of God is the sum of that curse that the law threatens. Their misery consists in this, that they are children of wrath and vessels of wrath, filled up with wrath. This is what they will be afraid of when they see the Son of Man coming, Revelation 6.16. They will cry to the mountains, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath has come, and who shall be able to stand? The dreadfulness of hell is comprehended in that it is a winepress of wrath. The dreadfulness of the cup that they have to drink consists in that, that it is a cup of God's wrath. But secondly, they in hell probably suffer from the more direct expression of the wrath of God, immediately from God himself. It is probable that they will have immediately to do with God, for they shall fall into the hands of the living God. As God in heaven immediately manifests and expresses his love to the saints, in which they are rendered inexpressibly happy, so it is most probable that God will immediately express and manifest his wrath to the wicked in hell, for the making of them perfectly miserable. This seems to be implied in that expression of being punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord. Second Thessalonians 1 verse 9 The wrath of God immediately expressed towards them will be especially like fire, and as fire and brimstone rain down from heaven upon them like thunder and lightning coming down from God upon them, first typified by the destruction of Sodom. Proposition number two. God whose wrath is inflicted in hell is almighty. It can produce every effect that is in an act of power. It can't be limited as to the degree of any effect. Proposition number three, in hell is endured the fierceness of the wrath of this almighty being. God, in executing vengeance on ungodly men, is sometimes spoken of as one whose wrath is enraged. Thus we often in scripture read of the fury of God, the fierceness of his anger, and of a heat of great anger. God is spoken of as rising up as a man awakened out of sleep and as a mighty man that shouts by reason of wine. And fury is said to come upon God's face as a bear bereaved of her whelps. Hosea 13 verse 8 Not that fury or fierceness properly belong to God. No God is infinitely far from those imperfections that are implied in such passions as in men that are called by that name. But the wrath of God with respect to the terrible effects of it that are executed in hell is called by those names because they denote the greatest degree of anger or wrath. Men, when they are provoked to a very great degree, are said to be in a rage. Their anger to be fierce and furious. 
And men, when their anger is raised to fury or fierceness, or want to exert themselves more vigorously in executing revenge. They will lay out their strengths at such times, and the revenge they seek is greater. The effects of it are more dreadful, Isaiah 27, verses 3 and 4. Upon these accounts, the damned in hell are said to suffer the fierceness of the wrath of Almighty God. Though the anger of God be not a passionate anger, the anger of God is so great and the effects of it are so dreadful that in this respect it is, as it were, the fierceness of his wrath. A mighty man, when enraged, he exerts himself. He lays out his strength to a great degree. So God, in punishing the damned, acts as an almighty being enraged in so dreadful a manner, will he exercise and express his wrath. And so terrible will be the effects of it. God will inflict wrath without any pity or moderation. As a man, when his anger is raised to the degree of rage or fury or fierceness, his wrath excludes all pity. His anger is so great that his whole aim is at the mischief of him who is the object of his wrath. He has no consideration of his good or welfare, nor does he care what becomes of the subject of his wrath. His anger rises so high as to allow no room for a thought of any mercy. So God exercises no pity in any degree towards the damned. Though he be infinitely far from being driven on by passion, as weak as men are, and punishes in infinite wisdom and justice, Yet herein God is like one in the fury or fierceness of wrath, that he has no pity upon them. A day of mercy is at an end, and a door of mercy is shut, and all exercises of mercy or compassion are at an end. God is not at all restrained by any such thing as pity in any degree. He has no respect at all to the welfare of those that are in hell. He doesn't withhold or lighten his hand in any measure out of any respect to the ease of the subjects of his anger. He exercises no caution here, lest his hand should be heavier upon them than they can bear, or lest their misery should be altogether insupportable. Their own good is not what he aims at, but their misery. It is not their good that they are continued in being for, but it is for misery and only that. And therefore God will bring misery upon them without regard to their well-being. The whole design of God with respect to them is to show his wrath and not to show his mercy, Romans 9.22. And therefore he will exercise wrath without mercy towards them. They are vessels of wrath. That is their end and therefore are vessels that shall be filled up with wrath without any mixture of mercy. God lets his almighty arm alight upon them without any restraint or alleviation, and continues it without giving them any rest. When God looks upon them and sees how exceeding miserable they are, and what intolerable and insupportable anguish they are in, how their souls utterly sink and can't endure, when he sees how unutterably dreadful their case is, he has no pity. His heart has no relenting. When he hears their dreadful shrieks and cries and lamentations, he will not repent. It would be impossible to move God by prayers and entreaties to hold his hand. He has now become inexorable, and justice shall have its full course. And therefore it is said in Job 27.22 that God shall cast on the wicked and not spare. Herein the expressions of God's wrath in another world differ from all the exercises of it in this world. There are many evils that God inflicts on men in this world that are fruits of his displeasure. But here is always some mercy mixed with judgment. God doesn't execute the fierceness of his anger as in another world. He is not wont in this world to cast men into the winepress of his fierceness and wrath. There are sometimes very terrible judgments that men are the subjects of in this world, but yet the case is never so in this world that a man's case is so dreadful that he can't be said to have any mercy at all attending the affliction. This world is not a world for wrath without mercy. 
It is not a place designed for that fierceness of wrath. There is always here some restraint that God, as it were, lays on himself, lest he should lay his hand too heavy, lest he should smite too severely. There is, as it were, caution used and respect had to our frames. There are always some mitigating circumstances, something thrown into the cup to allay the bitterness of it. The cup of wrath is not without mixture here. Here are some intermissions or abatements granted, Psalm 78, verse 38. Many a time turned he his anger away and did not stir up all his wrath. But in another world, God will stir up all his wrath. It will come like a flood or rapid torrent that has no dam or impediment to stop it. In this world, God is wont to stay his rough wind in the day of his east wind, Isaiah 27, 8. But in another world, there shall be no restraint to the tempest of divine wrath. There are three things that make it evident that in hell God executes wrath without any pity. First, if God exercised any pity towards them, their misery would not be perfect. The misery of the damned is perfect misery, and is so represented in Scripture because it is called the blackness of darkness, Jude 13. It is an Hebraism, an expression which according to the idiom of the Hebrew tongue signifies a perfection of darkness or misery. And so it is said that the wrath of God is poured out without mixture, Revelation 14, verse 10. The second death is a perfect destruction. The wrath of God shall consume his enemies as the fat of lambs. They shall consume into smoke. They shall consume away. He shall tear them in pieces, and he shall rend the call of their heart. He will devour them as a lion, as in the thirteenth of Hosea, verse 8. He shall grind them to powder. But now, if God had any pity upon them, he would not make their misery thus perfect without any comfort. If he pitied them, he would cast out something to allay their torment. He would grant some mitigating circumstance. For it is easy for him to do if he pleases. If he had any pity, he would not deny them a sip of water to cool their tongues. Yea, if God had any pity towards them, that would be a mitigating circumstance. It would be a comforting consideration if they could think that God pitied them, if they could think that God heard their groans and cries with some relenting, and that they could somewhat move his heart to compassion towards them. That would be a relief to them. Here would not be wrath without mixture, because pity would be mixed with it. Number two. If God had any pity towards them, their misery would not be without some intermission. If he had any pity towards them, he would give them some respite. He would not continue them subject to such extreme misery every moment without the least intermission, though they never so earnestly desire it. If God had any pity, he would not look upon it too much that they should enjoy one moment's rest, but they have no rest. Day nor night, Revelation 14.11. Number three. If God had any pity towards them, he would not hold them under such misery to all eternity. That he makes their misery absolutely endless shows that he has no pity towards them. That he has wholly given them up to misery and cast them utterly away as to any regard he has to their well-being. And that he has wholly devoted them to his wrath. If God had any regard to their well-being, though it was but little, yet less than an eternity would suffice. He would be willing to release them some time or other, though it might be a very long time, though it might be many thousands and millions of ages. He would be willing, first or last, either to take them into a more happy state, or to turn them to nothing, or change them into brutes, and so put an end to their torment that way. But on the contrary, he upholds them in being forever for that end, that they may be miserable forever. Such is the fierceness of his holy, wise, and just wrath, that when he has smitten them and sees how miserable they are under the strokes of his vengeance, how dreadful every moment of their misery is to them, yet he has no relenting, 
He will not stay his hand, but still continues to smite them. And when God sees how their hearts sink, and their souls are overwhelmed and deluged in despair, God doesn't lighten their hearts by giving them any hope. And after they have worn out days and years and ages and myriads of ages in such horrid torments, God's heart still will not relent towards them, but he'll still cast upon them and not spare. And when their souls are overwhelmed with this thought, that their misery is as yet but beginning, yet he will not spare, but will cause it to be so that it shall be but beginning, and shall ever be but beginning." Here I would mention one thing that seems to be signified by the dams enduring the fierceness of God's wrath, namely, that God will inflict wrath without any pity or moderation. God so inflicts his wrath upon them, so as very much to show the greatness of his strength in it. In this, the wrath of God as it is inflicted in hell may be compared to fury or fierceness of wrath. A strong man, when greatly enraged or in the fury of his wrath, will put forth his strength. He'll strain every nerve. The rage of his anger wakens up all his spirits and power, and he'll demonstrate what he can do. So God, in inflicting wrath on the damned in hell, to a very great degree exerts his strength. Though it be not with God as it is with an enraged creature that puts forth all the strength he has, for the power of God is infinite, and there is no such thing as the putting forth infinite power in any degree of misery of a creature, because let us suppose what degree of misery we will, yet the power of God being infinite can make the misery greater. Yet God inflicts wrath after such a manner on the damned that he manifests his power to a very great degree. The misery of the damned is so awful and is such an ineffable extremity that it is a very extraordinary discovery of the greatness of the power of God. This is one end that God has in the damnation of wicked men. To show the greatness of his power, as the apostle informs us in Romans 9.22. What if God, willing to show his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath? fitted to destruction and the same is implied in second thessalonians 1 verse 9 who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the lord and from the glory of his power which implies that the glory of god's power will appear in the punishment of wicked men or that god will very much glorify his great strength in this God will show his strength in the destruction of sinners in hell in a much greater degree than now we can conceive of and therefore it is said in the 90th Psalm, verse 11, Who knows the power of thine anger? Which is as much to say, none can know or conceive till they see or feel it. God will show his mighty power in the spiritual torment which they will endure, in the dreadful horror and amazement that their souls shall be filled with. It will be a great discovery of the greatness of God's strength that he can cause so great a degree of distress and anguish in the soul, that he can fill it with such amazing horror. The weight of his almighty arm shall be felt in those horrors. So also the greatness of his strength shall be manifested in the extremity of the torments of the body after the resurrection. God will execute wrath like a god, and therefore with a degree of power that far exceeds all the power of creatures. The power of poor weak men can put another to extreme sufferings, but they are nothing in comparison of those sufferings which they endure that suffer the wrath of God, as is plainly intimated in that of Luke 12, verses 4 and 5. Be not afraid of them which kill the body, and after that have no more that they can do. But I will forewarn you whom you shall fear. Fear him which after he has killed has power to cast into hell. Yea, I say unto you, fear him. Doubtless the power of the angels or devils can cause much greater suffering to a man than the power of weak men. Angels are great in strength and are called mighty angels. And the strength of the devil is spoken of as much greater than the strength of men, Ephesians 6 verse 12. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood 
but doubtless the suffering of the damned will be much greater than that, because they are from the glory of God's power, and are to make his power known. Application Inference If it be so, what reason we have to be thankful to God that we are not in hell, but in a world that is full of the goodness of God, a world where God does not execute the fierceness of his wrath, and where there is always mercy mixed with judgment, they that are under affliction may profitably think of what has been now said. This doctrine may be a suitable subject of consideration to them. You may perhaps look upon your circumstances very sad and doleful, and be ready to cry out that there is no sorrow like unto my sorrow. But if you consider what you have heard at this time, you may see great cause to bless the name of God, How heavy soever your affliction may seem to you, yet how great a difference is there between your case and the case of those that are in hell. If you sit and recount over the mercies that you still enjoy, you will find them innumerable. But if you were in hell, you would be in the enjoyment of no mercy. God is far from coming forth against you in fury and fierceness of wrath, and in an extraordinary manner putting forth his strength to afflict you, as he does towards the damned. The weight of God's almighty arm doesn't fall upon you. If it did, it would crush you in a moment and sink you into the lowest depths of woe and misery that now you have no experience of and can't conceive of. God is correcting you, but in measure, and does not deliver you unto death. And there are many things to mitigate or moderate your affliction that you may find. If you consider all earthly afflictions are attended with intermissions in some degree, your affliction is attended with hope and is mingled with mercy. God has manifestly thrown in something to allay the bitterness of the cup. You know not what the sufferings of the damned are. If you did, you would then see how that your afflictions are but light in comparison of them. But as a spark in comparison of a great furnace the weight of a drop compared with the cataracts or falls of a mighty river. You may seek for divine pity and hope to find, but they in hell cry in vain. They can't obtain any pity of God. You have encouragement to go to the throne of God with your afflictions. God says, call upon me in the day of trouble, Psalm 50, verse 15. And again, James 5, 13, is any among you afflicted, let him pray but they are forever shut out from any access to God. They have nowhere to go to express their complaints and give vent to their sorrows for any relief or help. What reason have we to bless God that we are not in hell, but in a world where we have opportunity of obtaining the pardon of our sins, and so escaping that place of torment and obtaining heaven, where the expressions of God's love are as great and wonderful as the afflictions of his wrath, in hell. It might have been that we should long before now have been in hell. How many others have gone to hell younger than we? Cannot we look back and see how at this and the other time we narrowly escaped going to hell? How many would the instances be if all in this congregation should bring in a catalog of their escapes and deliverances from death when they were in a crisis condition of their recovery from dangerous sickness and when they were brought near to the brink of the grave, and so to the brink of hell, of remarkable preservations and narrow escapes from being killed by accidents, when if they had died they should have gone to hell, and should have suffered those dreadful inflictions of divine wrath that we heard of at this time. We live in a world where death reigns, and where we lie continually exposed to death a thousand ways, and so to hell, whilst in a Christless condition. What reason, therefore, have we to bless God that we are out of hell? What reason have those that are yet in a Christless condition to praise the name of God that they are on earth and not in hell? There are some that have hung by nothing but a slender thread over the pit of hell for forty or fifty or sixty years, yet through God's wonderful preservation they aren't yet in hell. A wise man would not venture to hang in such a state as they are in a quarter of an hour for all the world, for fear that that thread should break in that time, and they should fall into hell. And yet they have hung thus long, 
and are yet out of hell. What cause have such to wonder at God's goodness, and how should the goodness and long-suffering and forbearance of God lead them to repentance? And what cause have those that are converted to bless God that they are out of hell, when they look back and consider how long they were in a Christless state, and how often in that state their lives have been exposed? What reason have they to bless God that they did not die in that state before they were converted? And then they would have gone down to hell, where they must have suffered the infliction of the fierceness of the wrath of an almighty God. They not only hereby have hitherto escaped that dreadful punishment, but they have this advantage by it, that they have been reserved to show the great mercy bestowed upon them of saving repentance and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, and a pardon of all their sins, in which they are now forever saved from that misery, and are entitled to eternal glory. Application number two. A warning to the awakening of those that are in a Christless condition. It is a very awful thing to be the subject of the wrath of God in any degree. Tis what renders a case of any creature very dismal to be at odds with his creator, that there should not be peace between God and him. A man had better be out with all mankind and have every man, woman, and child upon earth, and also all the angels, yea, to have every creature in heaven and earth against him, than to have God against him. The wrath of God is the most terrible thing in the world. Sin is an infinitely great moral evil. So God's wrath is the greatest natural evil. You that are in a Christless condition, you are all the children of wrath. The wrath of God abides upon you. You all lie exposed to suffer that that you have now heard. Consider therefore how dreadful that misery is. It is an awful thing for a person to be cast out of the world and as it were cast out of God's sight to be banished and shut out of the universe from all parts of it, where there is any of the tokens or fruits or communication of the goodness of God, to be cast into outer darkness and into that place of wrath, which was made for no other end, and there to have their beings continued and upheld for no other end, but to endure the wrath of God. They are to suffer the wrath of God, both in the punishment of loss and the punishment of sins, to suffer the loss of heaven, to see others sitting down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven, and themselves shut out in wrath, to have the door shut against them in wrath, and to come after the door shut and cry, Lord, Lord, open to us, and have him answer in wrath, to be cut off and driven out of this world and from all the enjoyments of this world in wrath to be hurled out of their place and have all the streams of mercy cut off in wrath, to be delivered into the hands of cruel devils, to be tortured and rendered most miserable by them in wrath. And not only so, but for them to be subject forever to the more immediate inflictions of wrath, to fall into the hands of the living God, to be punished with everlasting destruction, to be subject to the fierceness of his wrath, to have an omnipresent God forever tearing them in pieces, girded with strength, exercising his furious vengeance without any restraint, pity, or moderation, decking himself with glory and majesty, to execute revenge and justice upon them, thundering upon them with his great power with continual peals, or rather with one perpetual and everlasting clap of thunder, and filling their souls full with one unceasing flash of light, with one glowing stream of brimstone forever coming down from heaven upon them. How dreadful will it be when they shall be driven away at the day of judgment and wrath, to enter into everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels, and shall after that forever to be tormented in soul and body by the wrath of God, to have God appearing in the greatness of his majesty in their destruction, to be subject to all the fury of that wrath that shall consume the earth with her increase, and set on fire the foundations of the mountains, and shall be so hot as to burn the earth even to its center, or burn to the lowest hell in the destruction that God shall shake heaven and earth, when Bashan and Carmel 
shall languish and the flower of Lebanon shall languish and the mountains shall quake at him and the hills shall melt and the earth shall be burnt at his presence and the world and all that dwells therein when his fury shall be poured out like fire and the rock shall be thrown down by him who can then stand before his indignation who can abide in the fierceness of his anger Nahum 1 verse 6 how dreadful will the case of the wicked be in the day of God, in which the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved and shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements melt with fervent heat. How awful will the case of the wicked be in the day when he comes forth out of heaven, that is faithful and true and in righteousness does judge and make war, and his eyes as a flame of fire, and on his head many crowns, and has on his vesture and on his Thy, a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords, Revelation 19.16, with the armies of heaven following him to tread the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And they shall be cast into that winepress. But that you have more of a sense of the dreadfulness of your case, if you should be cast into hell, consider, number one, how awful that shows your case would be that he is almighty, whose wrath you must suffer. Consider the consequences of this, his omnipotence. If he be almighty, he is able to make you as miserable as he pleases. If he be almighty, then it will follow that you are holy in his hands, and he is able to make miserable your thoughts. Your understandings are in your hands, and he is able to fill them with those gloomy apprehensions. And that sight of his wrath it shall fill you with the greatest horror. Your wills and affections are in his hands, and he is able to order matters so with respect to them. It shall make you most miserable. And your bodies are in his hands, and he is able to fill you with the greatest misery in them. He is able wholly and perfectly to destroy you in soul and body. If he is almighty, then he is able to cause all means of misery. Earthly enemies have oftentimes racked their brains to find out means in which to torment others. And they have been put to it to torment so much as to answer the rage of their anger. They have done what they could and would have done more if they could. Matthew 10.28 They have no more than th they can do. But this never can be said of God that he has no more that he can do. He never lacks means to procure the misery of his enemies. We can conceive of many things that may contribute to the misery of any one, but we can conceive of nothing of this nature that the power of God can't procure. Yea, he can easily cause thousands of means of misery that we can't conceive of. He can dispose of you in what place he pleases and in what circumstances. All things that could in any respect be a means of comfort or support, they are in his hands, and he can take them away. Whatsoever you could seek any comfort in, he can cause that it shall be no means to comfort you. If you should endeavor to find something to comfort and pity you among your fellow damned, and should desire that some of them should console your case, God can cause that on the contrary... All the rest of the dam, instead of pitying you and helping you, should contribute to your misery and be tormentors to you. Number three, if God be an almighty being, then he can make you as capable of misery as he pleases. He can enlarge your capacity of misery to what degree he will. He can make you capable of ten thousand times so much more misery as it is possible men should subsist under in the present state if he pleases. Doubtless wicked men's capacity of misery will be enlarged in the other world. The vessel will be enlarged that it may be filled with a greater degree of wrath. Here when I speak of God's enlarging men's capacity of misery, I don't mean that he will increase their strength to bear up or support themselves under their misery, but only a capableness of receiving more misery, a capableness of being the subjects of a greater degree of it. They may be capable of receiving more misery and yet not have greater strength to bear or support themselves under it. And therefore it seems to be an improper and wrong expression that sometimes is used to say that the damned are made strong to bear misery. Such an expression seems to hold forth as though they were made strong to bear up and keep from sinking under misery, whereas this is utterly wrong. For the damned in this sense can't bear the misery of hell. The misery is greater than they can bear, Isaiah 33, verse 14. 
Who among us can dwell with the devouring fire? Who among us shall dwell with everlasting burnings? Ezekiel 22, verse 14. Can your heart endure? Or can your hands be strong in the day that I shall deal with you? There is none can bear the torments, nor do they in this sense bear them, but sink under them, are crushed under them, are utterly destroyed under them. God enlarges their capableness of receiving or being made the subjects of misery, but he doesn't make them strong to bear the misery. A given a man greater strength to support himself under misery doesn't make him more capable of misery, but less. On the contrary, weakening the soul or debilitating and disheartening the mind is what renders the soul more susceptible of misery. The weaker the soul, the less able to support itself, and therefore the more liable to the force of what hurts it, or which is the same thing, the more capable of receiving misery from it. The more the subject of misery is debilitated in strength and courage and the like, the more susceptible is it made of misery. But God, being almighty, is able to make you capable of as much misery as he pleases. He has you in his hands, and he can in all respects dispose you as is fit to be a subject of misery, and that as much as he pleases. He can weaken and debilitate you as much as he will. If you hope that it should so happen that you should be damned, that you would fit yourself to bear it, and bear up under it as well as you can, consider that God, being almighty, can take away all your strength and all courage as much as he will. He can make your heart as weak as he will. The misery of any being much depends on the disposition of the subject. He has a soul with all its faculties and principles and affections in his hands, and he can in all respects so dispose them as to make them most disposed to misery. He can cause that all the thoughts shall work so as to fill the mind most with horror. God knows all the avenues of misery. He knows what the floodgates are and can open them when he will. He has a body in his hand and can so dispose that as much as he will to admit and receive torment. For the body may be strong in one sense so as to last and not be consumed and dissolved with torment. Yet it may not withstand that by an almighty God. Consider that God will do these things to that degree as to show the exceeding greatness of his power, the fierceness of his wrath that shall be inflicted. His power will procure dreadful means of torment, and he will dispose of you in the most awful circumstances. He will fill your soul and body with so great a degree of misery as will be a very great manifestation of the majesty and power of God in the sight even of the saints and angels. The glory of his power will appear herein to them. Revelation 14.10 He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And remember that this is never to have an end, but is to last to all eternity. In hell is inflicted the wrath of the Almighty God, dated April 1734. Jonathan Edwards